about to be. Uh, first and foremost, who left their cell phone here? <laughs> Free phone calls for me. Okay, I'm gonna do a quick introduction. I'm Agent X, aka Jesse Krems. I'm the president and co-founder of the Hacker Foundation. And uh, let me talk to you about some of the people that are here. This is uh, Jim Schuyler. He's from, uh, he's our operative in Uganda right now. This is Nick Farr. He's our accountant and registered CPA, or he's working on it very hard. That's uh, Fraser Cunningham. You've probably seen him around, aka Nulltone. He's our secretary, and I think I just outed him. Uh, that's Locke. Can I use your real name? Yeah. Okay, that's Stephen Kirk. He runs all the networks here at DEF CON. <laughs> you got Wi-Fi? It's because you got Locke. This man right here, he works for... Uh, Louise. I, no, it's not Louise. No, no, he works <laughs> for Louise. <laughs> <laughs> that's Christian. That's Chris, oh, sorry. Oh. Okay. I'm just going to give this cell phone to some guy. So, uh, and then that's Jennifer at the end, and that man in between who I haven't talked to a lot, uh, he's going to be talking about one of our projects in Chicago. And this man bringing me water here is Code24, who's a stalwart friend. Thank you very much. So here's our quick history of the Hacker Foundation um, and where we've been and where we're going kind of thing. In a... In 1996, Major Malfunction, one of the head speaker goons, or one of the head goons, and who's currently speaking another track and can't be here, went to Sarajevo to set up a BBS uh, to help the people that were trapped in their apartments by snipers. A BBS in a war-torn area is a pretty useful tool because you know you need to know where you can get water, where you can get, where it's safe to travel, and so on and so forth. He's the one in the middle, uh, and so he he told me about this uh, prior to DEFCON 9. It's been rattling around in my head. I'm like. Whoa, that's so cool. Fly into war-torn areas, set up network equipment. Yeah! So, the, um, so that rattled around in my head, and I thought about that for a while. And then Nick and I were attending bar over at Caesars one night, and I, this is how I met Nick, and he was, he was helping me out, and I was like, wow, Nick's a really cool guy. He's really on it, and he's way more organized than me. And the next day, we were up on top of the uh, Alexis Park, playing with Uncle I one of Uncle Iris' sat phones. The... Um, and uh, so, the, uh, and we were talking about that, and we thought this was a great tool, it's really awesome. The, um, the, uh, wait a second. Cue for me, I can't cue. So we are playing with the satellite equipment, we thought this was really awesome, we were like, what could we do with this? And we were thinking about something called Medici Sands Frontier at the time, Doctors Without Borders. And it was like, yeah, Hackers Without Borders. That won't scare anyone. Um, <laughs> And so we kind of toned it down a little at that time, and we decided to call it Hackers for Humanity. And we talked about it a little, and that was about where we left it. And then at DEF CON 10, uh, I sent out a mailing to DC forums, and we got a bunch of people together, he's one of them, to uh, talk about what Hackers for Humanity is going to be, what, it, you know, what this means. Um, and we went over to Metro Pizza, which has these huge white paper tablecloths, and ideas were flying just fast and furious about what Hackers for Humanity should be. Should be this, should be that. We really came out of this meeting with two things, or three things, a long possible list of activities, a lot of energy, and Priest said something that was really important, which was, if you want to make it real, you got to make it formal. So uh, we started to do that. Uh, Nick and I, before DEF CON 11, exchanged boatloads of email talking about what Hackers for Andy should be and how we could help all these people. Yeah. And it was like, oh, this is really confusing, totally nuts. So what we did was we, um, we kind of came up with this idea of a hacker foundation. And that's an overarching organization that's an umbrella for all other activities that you want to do. And we call these activities projects. Yes, we're that kind of umbrella. Um, and then, so we get together at DEF CON 11, we talk, and then immediately afterward, uh, Nick goes back to California and files the paperwork to make us a California benefit corporation, uh, public benefit corporation in California. This is really important. This is the state level exempt status. And then we go, okay, this is great. We get that, we file that in August. We get that on Christmas of 2003. Christmas Eve to be specific, a nice little gift from the government. Well, that's a long time. That's just an idea about how slow this bureaucracy moves. 
And then we decide, okay, we're going to go for the big kahuna. 501c3 status, tax exempt, federal government, our friends, the IRS. Yeah, they're actually really great um, because they're like, yeah, we can do that for you. So we file our paperwork with them shortly before our first presentation at DEF CON 12. And at DEF CON 12, we, we kind of gave a lot of people a little toy mint turbo talk hint about what we were going to be doing and where we were at, which was in waiting mode. Shortly thereafter, we, uh, we got our paperwork. It's in process. In April, we get a call back from the IRS. Yeah, that's a fair ways off. It's like with 10 months, roughly, after we filed our paperwork before we heard from them. And they had some questions about us, and they talked to us about, you know, we had some very idealistic ideas about what our goals should be. And, you know, we thought it would be really easy. You know, we'd, we'd get all this money from Cisco. Um, we'd get all this money from everybody, and we'd get networking equipment. We'd load it on a plane. We'd fly to some godforsaken place that needs help. We'd help them, and then we'd be back by, you know, Friday afternoon for beer. I mean, come on, that's what every NGO and nonprofit agency does, right? Well, it's not that sexy. And Nick's going to talk about not that sexy for me. Um, Thanks, Jesse. Um, one of the things the IRS asked us to do when they sent a letter back in response to our initial application was outline uh, some of the things we're going to do. There, the tax law here is very specific. Um, there are very certain things that you can do. There's structures for churches, structures for schools. Um, and what we want to do is we want to be the nonprofit organization for the community. Uh, coming up in the speech a little bit later, you're going to hear a lot about um, some really exciting projects, things going on in Uganda, things going on in Chicago, and Fraser is going to do a little brief about how we want to get you involved um, and how we'd like to m give your projects um, a little bit of legitimacy in terms of federal tax law and to be able to offer uh, tax deductible status for donations that people give to your products, projects. Uh, the first goal that we have, of course, to get the ball rolling, and we've started doing it at the StepCon, is to raise money. Over the past year, the Hacker Foundation has been running largely through the generosity of the people on our board, the directors, the people who are here from day one. Um, and raising money is hard. You know, when we thought, oh, it's going to be gloriful, it's going to be great, just like Jesse was saying, um, the first step to any project that you want to do is raising the funds to be able to go do it. And that's hard. It's hard to ask people for money. Uh, they're wondering, what are they getting in exchange? Um, in exchange, what we'd like to be able to do is involve the community more. We have an application on our website, hackerfoundation.org. Basically, any, almost any open source coding project, almost any robotics project, almost anything that has some kind of charitable aspect or some kind of uh, charitable bent to it can get tax-exempt status through the Hacker Foundation. And one of our goals is to be able to envelop and to take anybody in the community who's interested in that, interested in raising more money, interested in building capacity, uh, and get them involved and get people networking. And that the, leads into the third goal, what we're doing, uh, building infrastructure for the future, getting everybody networked, getting everybody together, Hacker Foundation handling the paperwork to free you guys up uh, to do the intellectual things. But uh, I'd like to get uh, right now to Jim's project, uh, the Uganda Computer Initiative. It's a really exciting talk. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jim Schuyler, and I'm the East Africa Regional Coordinator for the uh, Hacker Foundation. And my project is UCI, uh, or the Uganda Computer Initiative. Uh, this is the prototype project of Hackers for Humanity, which is the humanitarian arm of the Hacker Foundation. Uh, just about a month ago, I returned from a three months long stay in uh, Hoima, Uganda. Uh, where I was working as an open volunteer with local and international aid organizations providing technical support and uh, training at health clinics, community-based organizations, and internally displaced people's camps. Uganda is, in a word, paradise. In seven words, paradise with a bomb strapped to it. When I first traveled to Uganda in 1999, I was captivated. Uh, the landscape was lush, green, perfect. Um, the people were warm, 
generous, hospitable, kind. With what little they had, they would give me food and welcome me into their homes. You know, the British actually have called Uganda the Pearl of Africa, uh, which is ironic because you won't find a single damn oyster in the entire country. Um, and Tanzania's got diamonds, but they didn't get a sweet nickname. My godparents are Ugandan, and they met my father and mother uh, while they were studying in Pennsylvania in the late 80s. And when I turned 16, my father told me that it was time for me to go visit them. So, uh, 30 or so hours of planes, trains, and automobiles, and we were in Africa. Uh, now, as will happen with idealistic, wide-eyed young men um, who see true beauty for the first time in their lives, I fell in love. I was completely set. I had spent most of my youth in suburban America uh, playing video games, skateboarding, and uh, <laughs> I, I never got caught. Um, <laughs> and being in Africa really changed me. It was, uh, it was sort of one of those times where you just know you're going to wind up somewhere for the rest of your life, and as fate would have it, it looks like I'll be able to. Um, you know, I, Film the tattoo. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's under his shirt. But I don't have a slide for this one, sorry. Yeah. I'm bad at this. Um, yeah, actually, this is the largest group of white people I have seen in about a year. I'm a little creeped out right now. I apologize. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, sure, uh, even when I went there at 16, there's been a civil war raging in the north of the country for about 20 years. It's still going. Um, there were tanks upended in ditches, uh, you know, kids running around with dirty shirts and bare feet. And uh, somehow, you know, even though you couldn't drink the water, it was perfect. It was just absolutely perfect. And, uh, you know, really Uganda is, in a, it is a country in a state of flux. Uh, corruption, civil war, hunger, and disease are realities in Uganda. During my first week of my recent stay, I got malaria. Uh, and for those of you who have not had malaria yet, you are not missing out on much. Just uh, delete that from your list of priorities and move on to the next one, like typhoid. Um, you know, and uh, even most of the roads are still unpaved in Uganda. Uh, transport is long, arduous. Uh, power is intermittent. Hardline data connections are unreliable and uh, few and far between. But still, um, you know, it's, it's kind of needless to say that my... Uh, blog missed an update for a week or two, uh, and I think I might have missed a couple of MySpace invites. But where those limitations might seem to create closed doors, uh, wireless mesh networks are starting to pop up all across even the remote regions of the country. Uh, expansive GSM coverage uh, really is incredible. You see, because hardline data connections are nearly impossible to keep active and running, what the Ugandans, in, in cooperation with a lot of South African telecom companies, did was set up wireless towers all across the country. I mean, I could literally get a clear, I could get a clearer signal in the middle of nowhere in Hoima. I, I could get a clearer signal than I could in downtown Chicago. It was incredible. And so instead of just sort of going with traditional methods of connectivity, they're really branching out into new and incredible, just exciting uh, means of creating communication. Um, you'll even see internet cafes in little one-room storefronts. Uh, they're, you know, on satellite phones, they're irregularly connected, poor administration, doesn't matter, they're there. And Ugandans are going through their very own electronic revolution. Uh, you'd be amazed by how many are taught to type in their primary school education system, and they are now using email. I, I don't think many of them have picked up on Friendster, but they definitely are, uh, are communicating with each other within country. Um, now, as well as regular citizens, non-government organizations like the Danish, and, uh, the Danish Cooperative for International Development, MS, uh, the United Nations Humanitarian and Children's Relief Fund, 
and the International Medical Corps, all, all three of whom I've worked with, are starting to take advantage of these incredible new technologies and uh, to improve their communication and really streamline their methods of just connectivity and uh, productivity. Um, they're also using them to preserve client records, which is a problem they've been really struggling with for years. Um, the big problem that I discovered while I was working in country was that the, the organizations are relying, the people on the ground, you know, in the remote districts are relying on outdated hardware and software. I, I mean, woefully outdated hardware and software. Uh, for example, I've been working with a community-based organization, the Hoima Nursery School, Nursery School Development Association, or HNSDA, uh, extensively for the past two months or so. And HNSDA relies on its computers to create teaching materials and keep both its financial and client records for hundreds of nursery school teachers in Western Uganda. Uh, that's two of them, actually. And um, when I first started with HNSDA, only one of their three office machines was up and running. And what was it running, you might ask? Uh, Windows 95 on a Pentium 2 with 48 megs of memory, a completely shot hard drive, and no CD-ROM. And this was the best that they could get out to them. I'm, I'm not kidding, this was the best. Uh, another example is Hadfa, the Hoima District Farmers Association. Now, Hadfa uses its computers to create databases of clients, very remote clients. These people have no other means of connectivity except for the sort of general addresses that are used. Um, I got a little click happy there, sorry. Uh, and when I went to work with them, all four of their donated office computers were completely shot. All four of them completely shot by, does anyone remember the hurry virus? I, I think McAfee 98 successfully took care of it for most of us. Two days. What happens is that because so few Ugandans own computers, they take flash drives and floppy disks and can keep all of their own records, all of their correspondence, all of their email logs, everything. And they just carry them around with them in pockets on chain drives. And then they go anywhere that they know there's a printer and plug it in. And so viruses are passed around like crazy because they don't know how viruses are transmitted. Um, and because there are so few IT professionals available in Uganda, these NGOs and CBOs suffer. This is not to say that there are no IT professionals in Uganda, it's just that they're even more expensive than they are here. And the more I worked with these organizations, I mean, they're dedicated, incredible people who are doing good work, the more I realized that they needed a durable, sustainable solution uh, to their IT problems. And this is how the Uganda Computer Initiative was born. The primary objective of UCI is to provide an open source solution to the technological challenges NGOs and their subsidiary CBOs face on a daily basis. We want to also simultaneously provide training and resource materials to these staffers. We are talking about the Ugandans themselves so that they can become self-reliant so they no longer have to rely on these IT professionals who are overcharging them. You know, the cost just for transport from the major city of Kampala is ridiculous. They cannot afford this. And Furthermore, to empower all of the counterparts so that they can network together and everyone can support each other in sort of a nationwide uh, CBO and NGO network. Now, UCI has five primary goals. First, to develop and deliver the stable and workable open source options package uh, for NGOs and CBOs, including an alternative and continually customized Linux distro to replace whichever Windows system they're currently using. Because these computers are donated and they are preloaded before they come to them, they all have Windows in one form or another. Ugandans do not use Windows because their corporate, you know, head honchos tell them they have to. This is not about market share. Ugandans just don't have a choice. When the NGOs and CBOs receive these in bulk, in-kind donations, they don't have the resources or the IT staff available to fix them, change them, or provide a stable solution. Our next goal is to provide comprehensive training and support 
I mentioned this earlier, this is the training curricula package where we will bring them into our classrooms and train them on a pro bono basis. The next is to provide donated computer and networking hardware to these organizations on a proven need basis as determined by an application and approval process to be administered by the Hacker Foundation, Hackers for Humanity, and UCI. Also to develop and follow a monitoring and self-evaluation program to create quantifiable, quantifiable long-term and short-term goals so that the Hacker Foundation and its subsidiaries, the donors, anyone who chooses to donate to this project will know exactly what we are doing, what our goals are, and how we plan to achieve them, if we have achieved them and if we are being successful. And finally, to implement a long-term sustainability program in which Ugandan nationals will train along UCI staffers to one day replace them, being me, and become the directors of the organization. This is if at any point I decide to come back to a country where I can still get a cheeseburger. And I have to admit there really is a sixth, a sixth goal, and that's to promote hacker ideals and open source evangelism in Uganda and East Africa. There is no, there's no counterculture in Uganda. There's no culture of closed source or proprietary source uh, activism. You would be amazed by how open to the idea of free software an NGO or a CBO will be, even a, a regular user. The idea of not having to pay for a Linux distro is revolutionary. The savings to international aid organizations and to common individual users across the country who have connectivity will be immense. Uh, I'm also proud to announce another project tied, with, uh, tied in with UCI and Hackers for Humanity which is uh, Laptops for East Africa. This is not, of course, to be confused with the great program being run by the good folks over at computersforafrica.org. Uh, they really do, they are doing good work. Uh, what we're looking to do is target specifically Uganda and then Tanzania, Kenya, and Burundi and Rwanda. Um, the, the deal is this. We need newer equipment. And just walking around this con for the past three days, I see a lot of really nice laptops, and I gotta tell you, I want them, and I wanna give them to organizations who can use them. Actually, are we gonna be doing Q&A afterwards? We'll be doing Q&A afterwards. Um, laptops come with built-in UPS systems. When the power goes out, instead of having to fire up a diesel generator, a laptop just keeps running long enough to do what you need to do. They're small, they're portable, we can transport them easily. It is easy to ship a number of laptops instead of one or two desktops. And so what you do is you sign up with us. We give you a sticker to put on your laptop. When you're ready to upgrade to that shiny new box that you've been saving up for for the past few years, you donate the computer to us for a tax write-off, and we send it where it needs to go and where it will be used. Now, again, I'd like to thank you for your time and your patience. I'm really not very good at this, but uh, remember, please, geeks do come in all colors. And uh, I'd really like to see some of my Ugandan friends here in a couple years. Thank you. Yeah, and please definitely get some of those stickers because I know I'm getting one. I would love to see one of those Ugandans with uh, you know, uh, talk nerdy to me and uh, root me, and I would love to see that. So send me some pictures, please. Uh, my name is Louis Arouse. I wasn't announced in the beginning because I was taking care of something personal. But anyway, um, I'm the systems administrator for the Chicago Neighborhood Boys and Girls Club. Uh, and the Chicago, it's exactly what the name suggests. Kids come there, and they hang out with their friends, they play sports, and they just chill out after school. But we wanted something more for them. And in 2004, in March 2004, we set up for them a computer lab. And next slide, please. And that computer lab consisted of these things. Five Dell computers, three Emacs, a Clark Connect router, and some wireless access points and bridges. We were able to do all this with a small donation of about $10,000 from a large financial institution. We also have um, some office equipment as well for them, for the general staff of five standalone PCs, a Linux terminal server project, which is really cool if any of you have ever worked with that, and Jim already spoke something about that. 
um, and another router, and we also built for them a Athlon Debian file server, mail server, but I don't think that's too safe. But when you're a nonprofit, you do with what you got. Can the next slide, please? This is what our lab looks like when we were first building it. It's pretty sparse, but it works for what the kids need. Basically, I am chat with their friends, that's about it. You know, blogs every once in a while. They don't do much because they don't know much what's out there with what they got. Next slide. Some of them op having fun, opening, uh, opening day. Next. Next. And this is our current state of funding. Uh, that $10,000 that we got from that financial institution, so it's all gone. Um, the various hardware donations that we get from the community, pretty much useless because they're Lexmark's printers that they get for free anyway when they buy that other computer. Then they realize it's no, it's crap and then they give it to us. Um, and Packard Bells, they are still out there, I cannot believe it. So, and then the other one, we do get some private financial funding. Uh, some, these are some of the people who, who fund. Uh, this woman is the program director for the club. Uh, next one. And that's me, and obviously you can tell we need a lot of help if we're duct taping, uh, what is that, uh, switches to the wall. So you know we need some help. Next. So how are we gonna use this really cool hardware that we can probably get from the Hacker Foundation? Some of the things that we wanna do, I mean, cause these guys, they're getting together with some really big corporations and giving you that hardware that they're not gonna be using anyway, so you know, you guys can have some fun with it. Uh, we wanna build a local database. What does that mean? There are so many community businesses that support the club in many different ways. We want the kids to be able, once it's, once it's all set up, to go to these different community businesses, get some interesting stories from them, get some uh, contact information, photos, and create a nice database that's online for the parents to go research. Kind of like a good guy's yellow books, where they say, hey, these people donate to the club, I'm gonna go support them first. That way, hey, some of that money will then come back to the club, all is good. Maintaining the website. Some of these kids are pretty good. They want to learn about website building, but right now our current webpage is a static ASP website that was donated to us for free from, a, from an alum. It's nice and all, but it's not what we want. We want something that's live, maintainable, easy for them to use. We have over 70 years of historical newsletters that these people have created on mimeograph paper that are still in hard copy. We finally started digitizing some of them, but we want to be able to create a database of them in PDF with OCR. It's very nice. And I'll tell you why that's important in a second. And also, we want to create a photo archive. We have 70 years of photos as well. The reason is this, because next year we have the uh, 75th anniversary, sorry, it's the 75th anniversary coming up. We have people coming from all over the country. Some of these people are 80 years old, 90 years old, and they want to be able to see all the things that they remember in the past, but everybody believes that they're lying about. So they want to be able to come in, see all the photos on, up on a big LCD, and say, hey, that's me. Then they can take a little card, write down that number, go over to another computer, and print it out. So that way they've got a copy for themselves. And then what about for their little grandkid that they told, remember I, I scored that goal during that game, you didn't believe me? Here, check this out. They type in their name in the PDF archive and up comes every single PDF that they were in. Boom, there you go, print it out and they go, eat it, bitch. All right, anyway. <laughs> Next, we got a digital jukebox of legal MP3s and burned uh, CD backups. There's this really cool software called Tunes that, because I know if any of you got kids, yeah, they all agree on the same music all at the same time, definitely. But what this is, Tunes is a democratically designed um, email, excuse me, email, MP3 server, where they log on to the website for it, as long as they've got an account, and they get to vote which song they want to hear. And whichever song has the highest amount of votes, that's the one that gets played. So it's very, very cool, that's what I want. Computer repair and donation. These kids, I mean, they see something shiny, and they're like, ooh, I want to touch. You know, but, they, and they want to learn how to build computers, they want to repair them. We want more computers that are either broken that we can then, or people that send them in, repair them, give them back, or even better, have donations of those dead computers, the kids can repair them, and one project we want is that every sixth computer they build, they get to keep that seventh one. And then after a while, you're gonna be like, well, these kids are gonna be stacking up with computers, what are they gonna have, like a cluster and stuff? 
But yeah, that's one option if they want to do that. But the cool thing is, though, they get to then choose if they want to who they actually donate that computer to, which is even more fun, I think, because then they get to see and actually affect somebody else's life. Uh, next. These sound like some good ideas you guys might use also in your community? Okay, cool. <laughs> Uh, Linux terminal server project. You saw that lab, okay? It was pretty sparse. There was about eight total computers in there plus the router. Well, we've got it right now where if you connect two PlayStations in the room next to us, it blows out half the computers. Not too much fun. So what we want to do is set up a terminal server project where we can have lightweight, like Jim spoke about, lightweight um, laptops, which have their own power supply, so on and so forth, and be able to run at least 20, 25 computers for all these kids to then run those previous projects you saw. Uh, also the web server to host on all our online projects. Uh, events registration. You guys probably have some kids, okay? You can't always make your time to go out and sign them up for all these different things. Go online, register them, and you're done. Um, Timesheets for the timesheets for the staff so that way they can just sign in and the administration doesn't have to do all this stuff by hand. It's really sad. Next, please. Um, Wi-Fi for the park. We've got a really nice park out there and we want to be able to broadcast Wi-Fi out there and just for the people to come in and use, have the laptops, have a good time. If we can, which would be really great, is to be able to track the scores online, live. Once again, you guys can't always get to your kids' games. You can at least check the scores online, and RSS feed would be great. But anyway, you can check the scores online and then say, hey, when the kid comes home, I saw your game, you had a great time, I saw what you scored, that's excellent, and talk about it. Wireless video cams to watch the games online. Secured and password protected so that only the parents, well, and you guys, um, can watch the kids play, all right? Same thing, you want to be able to see your kids play, have, you know, score that one home run. Um, and finally, be able to provide the classes that the community and these kids have been looking for. I repair computers all day. Generally, all spam, viruses, uh, pop-up blockers, all that stuff. And it's the same thing every time, asking the exact same questions every single time, and I feel like I should just have a tape recorder of myself right there and just play it. So I want to be able to provide those classes for them so they can actually learn. And on those eight computers, it's not going to happen. But with what we want to do and with the help of the Hacker Foundation, I think it's pretty possible. Uh, next slide. And finally, just you know, thanks to the Hacker Foundation because hopefully together we can show the community and these kids that there's a lot more to tech and computers than just IMs and blogs. And that's my speech. Thanks, guys. So by now you can see that the Hacker Foundation is an official 501c nonprofit with a definite presence here at DEF CON. So that brings up the next question. What does that mean for you guys? How can the Hacker, De ha Hacker Foundation help your projects? What can the Hacker Foundation do for the entire hacker community? Basically, as an umbrella nonprofit, we can provide you with three things. Funding, advocacy, and nonprofit status. Funding is often the largest obstacle for a nonprofit initiative. In order to receive adequate funding, some projects will simply work under another organization. For instance, a great plan would become just another university project or government project, receiving nearly all of its funding from just one source. While that might seem like an okay idea, the project loses autonomy. Even though universities have great intentions, they're at the mercy of the school's budget, <coughs> policy, and agenda. If a project chooses to work with the Hacker Foundation, funding can come from a wide variety of sources, and we can work with you to develop those. The Hacker Foundation will work to keep projects connected to organizations that provide funding. And also, having IRS 501c tax exempt status means that your project can receive donations just like any other. The next issue is advocacy. The Hacker Foundation is all about security conscious individuals working together for positive action. 
and I'm sure we're all tired of stereotypes and misrepresentation, and this is our chance to fight that. Without a doubt, this will also provide more public awareness, positive exposure for the hacker community as a whole. Finally, as I mentioned before, the Hacker Foundation can provide 501c status for a project. The process to achieve this, achieve this status typically takes at least two years and an incredible amount of paperwork. It's definitely a headache, and hackers aren't really good at paperwork. By eliminating the headache, dealing with the IRS and a corporation, hopefully more people will be encouraged to turn their altruistic ideas into a reality. Bottom line is, the Hacker Foundation is ready. It is ready to receive your applications. It's ready to hear your ideas. We provide the networking for funding, 501c nonprofit status, and we make it easy enough as just submitting an application to us. So hopefully you've learned a little bit more about what the foundation's about, what we've been doing. If you haven't left. <laughs> the, uh, it's a long, hard road to get over what I call the hacker hump, which is, uh, oh, you're a hacker? Oh, God, you're obviously a criminal. Um, and that's not entirely undeserved. Because whenever, you don't see a lot of things that are like, hackers fly to, you know, bang after, or bam after a, uh, after an earthquake and do great works. You know, they don't do, they don't, that does, you don't see that stuff a lot. So that's one of the things we're also trying to take care of, and Fraser hit on that. So um, I'm going to open it up for questions. Yes, sir. Um, that's actually a really good question. Uh, yeah, yeah, let me touch it. So the main issue is, you're out in the bush somewhere, where do you get the juice from? It's not, it's not as bad as you think, actually. <laughs> uh, well, there are a number of ways that we really tackle the power situation. Um, our biggest problem was not in the cities. It was not in the even sort of developed rural districts. It was in the internally displaced people's camps. Uh, in the IDP camps, there would be about one government power line into the entire camp, and chances were pretty good that it didn't have juice in it. Uh, and when it did, it would spike to about 350 and set everything on fire. Yeah. Um, I lost two mini fridges that way. Uh, what we do is, as you mentioned, the battery gang solution. The battery gang solution is an incredibly effective way. Uh, y you'll see this in a lot of, I guess, infomercials. It'll be a group of uh, car batteries ganged together and then inverted. I, I'm not really a tech geek, but I know we do use the battery gang. Um, we also have a lot of solar cells that have been donated. Uh, but it's a very, solar technology is difficult. We are on the equator. We have a lot of sunlight. But we also have, uh, Uganda has two seasons, uh, rainy and sunny. You can guess which season is less effective for power from solar. Uh, also, the weather gets pretty volatile, and we have had solar racks, uh, panels, just demolished overnight while we've been sleeping, no matter how well we try to protect them. So right now, uh, we are using primarily diesel backup generators that we're lugging around. Petrol's expensive, but when you need it, you need it. Uh, and especially when you've got IMC volunteers using uh, their laptops, they, they really need that connectivity, so we'll just fire up a diesel. Uh, <laughs> you want to donate the fuel cells? We want to use them. Yeah, we're, we're not that well funded yet. <laughs> the, yeah, that's uh, one of the main issues that you see is that, you know, the next, everyone's like, oh, China's the next big market. Well, it is, but they're already really far ahead of the curve. Let's not worry about the next market. Let's worry the market about the next one, the, mar the next next market. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons that you see a lot of talk about Africa in the NGO world. But we don't want to focus too much on just Jim's project, as awesome as it is, um, because that's not what the Hacker Foundation just does. If you've got something else in mind, say mine detection equipment, our nice robotics challenge, and for a lot of reasons, uh, we're, we're, we're interested in that kind of stuff too. Yes, you. No, 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 it's actually the guy behind you. <laughs> Nick? He has the funding question about how you like manage the money. Uh, can I you think. repeat the Is question correct? real quickly? I still can't hear you. Could you stand up? Okay. Okay. Sorry, I got a cold. Uh, um, my understanding is that as an individual, I can't call up the Hacker Foundation and say, okay, I want to give organization to say the Apache, money to or the Apache organization and then give you money and take a tax deduction and then you give it to the Apache organization or to an individual. I have to give money to you and then you in theory in a separate process give it to another organization. Uh, have you figured out how that works with the t IRS tax when, code? What happens with uh, organization open source projects, they go through an application process. It's a more interactive process than a bureaucratic process. What we're doing is determining and making sure that what the goals and aims of each project are are charitable and fall under our section of the Internal Revenue Code. Once that happens, it can, it's not a question of you're donating money and earmarking funds. You as an organization go out there, directly solicit funds. You're working with the Hacker Foundation. The Hacker Foundation cashes the checks and gives the money straight back to you. That, that's all we do. And uh, actually, if I can add to that, the other thing you guys do is also the hardware as well, correct? Right. And, and that's the other thing is that the Hacker Foundation, uh, this, I was just referring to projects that apply that are looking for ways to be sort of nonprofit in a box. I hope there's nobody from the IRS here because... And in cases like mine, I'm actually hoping for the hardware versus getting money because I'd love to see the money guys, you know, give that out to the athletics department and have kids play basketball with the server. Right. I'd love to see it. I mean, it could be fun, but um, I don't think so. Uh, there's, there, there's two separate issues going on here. I think the issue that you were addressing is that if a group applies to the Hacker Foundation, will it be sort of a united way thing? And no. It's a much more streamlined, much more effective than that. But what the Hacker Foundation does as an organization on itself is go out there and actively raise funds uh, for all of its projects. So we can make our own decisions about giving you money. Because we'd love to do that. I mean, if everybody at DEF CON gave us hmm, 60 bucks or 80 bucks, we could A, throw a really sweet ass party this might seem familiar, you're at that party, or we could do a lot of really great projects. You, sir, in the Shani Sh LeMay. Um, at this time, we have three, pro we call these projects. It's, it, we should have done a slide about this. If you think about the, about the umbrella like this, the Hacker Foundation sits at the top and does the money, and then we have projects underneath it. Uganda, and in this case, the Chicago project. We also have another internal project, which is capacity building. You know, we need infrastructure and money, because that's how you make more money. Um, and then we have, and then we're actively seeking more projects. So is that what your question was, Mike? Yep, I'm familiar. Oh, are we are we out talking to other nerds about yes. nonprofity stuff? Yes. yes. Yeah, we 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 throw around words like capacity and IDP and you know UNHCR and all that kind of stuff all the time, and we kind of don't say it here, but. We definitely, you know, we're definitely in on that world, or we're getting more in on that world. Uh, most of us are amateur nonprofit workers, <laughs> but we're working up to pro. Yes, you. Um, my personal big, biggest motivation behind the Hacker Foundation, um, I think I talked about this a little earlier in someone else's speech. There's uh, two ways you can solve really bad problems like poverty, terrorism, and war. 
You can uh, buy them out, buy them in, or you can fight them. If we go to Africa, and I mean hackers go to Africa, or hackers go to Chicago, and we're like, hey, we're really cool people, we want to help you, and we raise them in our mental sphere, and get them trained in our mental sphere, and say open source is a good thing, and they're used to using open source, when Microsoft goes to visit in 10 years, who's got more feet on the ground? That's the kind of stuff, I mean, you want to see more hackers? Go where there aren't a lot already and make them. It's not that hard. Personally, I'm in it for the money. Yeah, he's in it for the money. Uh, but I can't speak to every, I've, I've actually studiously avoided that. We don't try and tell you why you should help other people. Everyone has those reasons. And uh, yeah, we're done. Let me uh, take one more because we're that good. Oh, he's giving me the, look at two minutes. Yes. Yes, this is what we want to hear. Yes, I do. We are interested in talking to you afterward about a potential project, sir. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Well, you can get a shirt for $20 and it's tax deductible. No, we have one right here. And I also have an issue of frack. Now this I haven't figured out how to give away yet. How about the biggest donation? It's an option, I mean, who's willing to buy this issue of frack and write it off? 20 bucks? Yeah, 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 you can do better than 20 bucks. Oh, I have a bid back there, yes sir. Huh? 30. Okay, a little bit more money. Oh, somebody's checking their wallet. <laughs> Excellent. I like ambition like that. And by the way, this is, this is kind of our money-making strategy. Yeah. I call it beg yeah, yeah. or torture. Or make Nick Farr eat a really, really big goddamn hamburger. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm also having some formal dinners with some rich people tonight. That'll help too, hopefully. Yeah, one more question. Well, actually, the idea is that we don't give them to individuals directly. They'll be used uh, in the offices of the NGOs and CBOs themselves. I, I keep using the acronym, it's non-governmental organizations. They're international aid organizations. Um, and the idea is we give them to the organizations because they can then use that hardware to affect the most people, or as many people as possible, more than a single individual could. So, thank you.